Well, praise the Lord, everyone. This is Mass Memorial CME Sunday School for September 17th, 2023, and I'm Sister Sharon. We're on our fall quarter, God's Law is Love, and this is based on the International Bible Lessons for Christian Teaching. Our unit one, love completes, the law falls short. Our lesson today, who is trustworthy? Our key verse is John the seventh chapter, the 18th verse. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory, but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true and no unrighteousness is in him. And our lesson scripture is John 7, 14 through 24. So we're in the gospel of John and the author of John is John the apostle of love or he's sometimes called John the evangelist. And here's a little bit of information about John. His name means Yahweh is gracious or the Lord is gracious. He's a brother to James. He was the son of father Zebedee and mother Salome. His previous occupation was a fisherman before he became an, uh, an apostle, before he became a disciple of Jesus Christ. He was called a son of thunder and he wrote the gospel of John, three letters, first, second, and third John and the revelation of Jesus Christ. So we have a good amount of background today, so we'll be prepared for our lesson. So this excerpt comes from the standard lesson commentary based on the international lesson series. And it says, a significant difference among the four gospels is the way the writers choose to begin their accounts. Mark begins with the ministry of John the Baptist without any reference to the birth or childhood of Jesus. Luke begins with the birth of John the Baptist and includes the nativity story of Jesus. Matthew begins with Jesus' genealogy thus pushing the story back to the time of King David. And then John the Evangelist, who we are studying um, from this gospel today, he pushes the story back to the very beginning of creation and before. Like if you look in John, the first chapter, it says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And so he takes us be before creation to when it was just God. So we also need to talk about the Feast of Tabernacles. It's also called the Feast of Booths or Tents because John 7 and 8 take place in the Jerusalem temple during the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles was a seven-day observance celebrating God's protection and provision. This festival was celebrated during the time of barley harvest, and this would be our September or October. The Jewish people constructed tents or booths or tabernacles to live in for the week to remind them of the time God made the children of Israel dwell in booths after he brought them out of the land of Egypt. So we can see this in Leviticus, the 23rd chapter, verses 33 through 43, where God tells them to um, celebrate this feast of tabernacles. And the people basically, um, it was Jerusalem, but it was actually 20 miles out from Jerusalem. Everyone would be living in a tent or a booth. And so, um, and then even within the city. So this is the Feast of Tabernacles. And we'll talk about that in our background scripture today and in our scripture today. We also need to talk about circum circumcision, excuse me. And it says, circumcision is the Jewish seal or authentication of being in covenant with God. Jewish boys were circumcised on the eighth day after their birth by removing the foreskin of the male sex organ. In Judaism, the ceremony or ritual is called Berit Malah. So I wanted to give you the scripture for this, and it comes from Genesis. So the very first book of the Bible, Genesis 17, 9 through 14. It says, then God said to Abraham, as for you, you must keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you for the generations to come. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you, the covenant you are to keep. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You are to undergo circumcision and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and you. For the generations to come, every male among you who is eight days old must be circumcised, including those born in your household or bought with your money from a foreigner, those who are not your offspring." Whether born in your household or bought with your money, they must be circumcised. My covenant in your flesh is to be an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who has not been circumcised in the flesh 
will be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. So this is what God told Abraham, okay, in Genesis, uh, where we have it in the book of Genesis about circumcision and the covenant of circumcision. Now we have been talking about the Sabbath and we need to, I need to remind you about the Sabbath. So the Sabbath, um, as far as being explained in Exodus 28 through 10 was part of the 10 commandments and those commandments were given to Moses. And so again, Genesis, um, Abraham was given the covenant of circumcision. And then, so it's Genesis, Exodus in the Bible, as far as when we're looking at the books, the Bible, and then Moses was given the 10 commandments and the, um, the commandment about the Sabbath is within the Ten Commandments, and the Jewish people call this the Mosaic Law, or the Law of Moses. And so Exodus 28 through 10 says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. So this is the commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. So now we're gonna look at a background scripture and you'll see that um, talking about circumcision, talking about the, um, the Feast of Tabernacles and talking about Sabbath all come into this lesson. So the background scripture is John 7, 1 through 13. Our actual lesson starts with John 7, 14. So it says, after these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, but he did not want to walk in Judea because the Jews sought to kill him. And we'll talk about what after these things means when we do the lesson. Now, the Jews feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brothers therefore said to him, and these are his actual um, half brothers. So these are physical brothers. Okay, his brothers therefore said to him, depart from here and go into Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. And then it says, for even his brothers did not believe in him. So when they were telling him to go to the feast and make himself known, they, they didn't believe in him. Now we come to find out later on um, after Jesus Passed away, passed away and didn't resurrect it. Well, we come to find out that um, James and his brother Jude um, did come to believe in him. We don't know about all his brothers, but we do know about James and we believe also Jude did come to believe in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. So when they're telling him to go um, to Judea, okay, now Jesus is not going because they're trying to kill him, okay? The, the leaders of the people are trying to they kill him. So when they say the Jews, these are the leaders. We've been talking about the Pharisees, you know, the scribes, the Sadducees, the lawyers, and, and they're trying to kill him. And so he wasn't, and it wasn't his time. And we should say that. And, and, and that comes in verse six. It says, then Jesus said to them, my time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. So what he's saying is he knew it was not time for him to die yet. He knew that it was not time for him to be crucified, to be the sacrifice for our sins. And so and the more he was out in the open, the more they wanted to kill him. And things were going to be done in God's timing. And so at this time, he's not just openly out um, um, talking at, at all the things. And he wasn't going at the beginning of the Feast of Tabernacles. But his brothers were saying, go ahead and go so your disciples can see you and see what you're doing. You know what I mean? Because they said, if you, you know, if you're really the son of God or if you, you know, you shouldn't be doing stuff in secret. OK, so again, they did not believe in him. So then Jesus says in verse seven, the world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that it works are evil. You go up to this feast. I am not yet going up to this feast for my time has not yet fully come. When he has said these things to them, he remained in Galilee. So they went ahead to the feast of tabernacles. Then it says in verse 10, but when his brothers had gone up, then he also went up to the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. So in other words, he didn't make a grand stand when he went up to the, to the feast. He did go. Then the Jews sought him at the feast. So people were looking for him and said, where is he? And there was much complaining among the people concerning him. Some said he is good. Okay. Cause he has been doing these miracles and so forth. And and others said, no, on the contrary, he deceives the people. 
And some felt like that because they felt like he was breaking the Sabbath. Okay. And so, however, no one spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews. Okay. So this is what's going on right before our lesson. Some people are saying um, he, he's a good teacher. Some people are saying, no, he's not. Some people are saying he's telling the truth. Some people are saying he's deceiving the people. And then our lesson comes in at John 7, 14. And so at John 7, 14, remember, Jesus has now come to um, the Feast of Tabernacles. And it says, now about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. So remember, the feast is seven days long. So about in the middle of that time, he goes up into the temple to teach. And the Jews marvel saying, how does this man know letters having never studied? Okay. And so basically they said, isn't he a carpenter? Okay. Because they didn't know him as a rabbi. You know, even if some people called him rabbi, he had not studied, you know, um, the way that they, you know, studied the law uh, or the Mosaic law. You know, he had been, grew up, Joseph, remember Joseph was his earthly father and his earthly father was a carpenter. So as far as a lot of people knew, they said, he hadn't studied anything and he hadn't studied because remember, he's the son of God. Amen. So they said he hasn't studied anything. How does this man know all this stuff? You know, um, know the letters. How does he know what it says in um, the Torah? You know what I mean? Or in the Pentateuch, as we would say, in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy at what they had at the time. How does he know? OK, having never studied. He said he didn't go to school. How does he know that? And like so basically he said, isn't he a carpenter? And then Jesus answers and says, my doctrine is not mine, but he is who sent me. If anyone would, if anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. So he's saying, I'm not speaking on my own authority. I'm not just making things up. He says, I'm speaking on God's doctrine. OK, he says, my doctrine is he says the doctrine he's speaking is not mine. So he's saying I'm speaking God's doctrine. OK, um, so I'm, I'm just not saying any old thing. You know, he says and then he says, and if you can discern, OK, if you want to know the will of the father, if you want to know what's from God and you listen to what I'm saying, you know, he says, if anyone wills to do his will. So in other words, we want to do God's will. OK, um, then we will know concerning this doctrine that is from God, okay? And that he's not speaking, Jesus is not speaking of his own authority. So he's saying, you know, listen to what I'm saying, okay? This is of God's authority. This is not um, a, a personal thing I'm trying to do. So then it comes down to, I call this section, what is your motive? And it says, he who speaks from himself, and this is Jesus still talking, he who speaks from himself seeks his own glory. But he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true and no unrighteousness is in him. That's our key verse as well. Say he who speaks from himself seeks his own glory. And we see today all these power brokers or people who want power and they're speaking and they're trying to get their own glory. OK, or they're, t you know, and unfortunately we have um, a, a spirit of antichrist in the world. Um, we know that there are false teachers. Um, and so what they're telling people is uh, like there's a scripture about itching ears. They're telling people what they want to hear. OK, and they're, or they're trying to build themselves up. It might look in some places might look like a church. OK, but is it glorifying God or even some teachers? Is it glorifying God? Is it about God? You know, um, when I was younger, I wrote a poem that said it's not about me. It's not about you. It's about God. And, and that's what we need to realize. So what is our motive? You know, what is the intent of our heart? And he says, he who speaks from himself seeks his own glory. You know, so, um, but he says, but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true and no unrighteousness is in him. And I want to quote here for you or show you John 5, 30. And this is in the, cl the classic Amplified Bible. And I have found this scripture years ago. And it's just one that um, I just that really touches me. And it says, and this is Jesus speaking. So I put it in red and, and Jesus says, I am able to do nothing from myself independently of my own accord, but only as I am taught by God and as I get his orders. And it'll be great for us to be, to say this as well. 
Even as I hear, I judge. I decide as I am bidden to decide. As the voice comes to me, so I give a decision. And my judgment is right, just righteous, because, this is the part here, everyone, I do not seek or consult my own will. I have no desire to do what is pleasing to myself, my own aim, my own purpose, but only the will and pleasure <clears throat> of the Father who sent me. But only the will and pleasure of the Father who sent me. So we all want to be able to say, not my will, but thy will be done. And we even say that when we say um, the Lord's Prayer. Okay, if we think about the Lord's prayer, our father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Okay, that's what that's the goal that it's not about our will. It's not about our way. It's not for our glory. It's about God's will, God's way for God's glory. And so Jesus is saying, when I'm speaking, he says, I'm speaking what the father who sent me wants me to speak. It's not my authority. It's the authority of my father, of, of the father. And so with that in mind, he's just saying, I'm not seeking my own glory. Okay. I'm seeking the glory of God or glory for God. Then Jesus goes on and he says, did not Moses give you the law yet? None of you keeps the law. Why do you seek to kill me? Okay. He goes to thing like when I always say when when God asks a question or when Jesus asks a question, Jesus already knows the answer. Again, he wants the people to think about what he wants the people to think about it. So he's saying, um, did not Moses give you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Why do you seek to kill me? Now, James 2.10 says, because he said, what, they're not keeping the law? James 2.10 says, whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. Okay. And so, and Jesus is going to go and elaborate about why he's talking about they're not keeping the law. But he says, for whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble at one point, he is guilty of all. So he's saying that Moses gave the law and they're very, very much concerned about the Mosaic law. And one of the things that they're concerned about when they're trying to make a decision about him is the fact that they feel that he has broken the Sabbath which we've talked about before. And so that means he broke the Mosaic law. And he said, but none of you all keep the law. And then he says, so since you don't, keep, you don't think I've kept the law, but you all don't keep the law, so why do you seek to kill me? So he's asking, that, why do you seek to kill me? You know, and this is really dealing with mainly the Jewish leaders because the next part I call it, I said, what the people don't know. Because the people answered and said, you have a demon. Who is trying to kill you? So remember, if we look back into our background scripture, Jesus told his brothers, they're trying to kill me. The more he spoke, remember, he kept speaking against the Pharisees. He kept speaking against the lawyers. You know, he called them a brood of vipers. You know, he told them that they weren't, you know, that they were tithing um, mint and so forth. He told them that they weren't concerned about mercy. And, uh, and so he was correcting them and or chastising them and they didn't like it. And so the more he spoke openly and the more he was visible, the more they plotted to kill him. And so the people, the general people might not have known that. So, you know, I put the thing, what the people don't know or what they say, well, he doesn't know won't hurt him. But down the line, it would, it, it will hurt. But it's the idea that the people said, you have a demon because they're like, they're thinking he's talking out of his head. That's what they're saying. You are talking out of your head. Like there's nobody sitting around here right now trying to kill you, you know what I mean? And so, um, so that's what they say to him. Now, then Jesus says, Jesus answered them and said to them, I did one work and you all marvel. So the one work, and this is, remember John said, excuse me, John seven at the beginning said, after these things, okay. The one work was when Jesus healed the man at the pool of Bethesda. And we talked about that briefly um, last week. We talked about the man who had dropsy, but then Jesus also healed the man at the pool of Bethesda on the Sabbath day. And we can find that in John 5, 1 through 10. So Jesus answered and said to them, I did one work. This is the one work he's talking about. 
I healed the man at the pool of Bethesda who had been um, basically handicapped there for 38 years. Okay. And, um, and remember they got upset. They got upset because Jesus healed on the Sabbath day and they called that work. And then they got upset because Jesus told the man, take up your bed and walk. And the man was carrying his bed on the Sabbath day and they called that work. And so he says, I did one work and you all marvel. So it wasn't when he was talking, he wasn't talking about marvel, like, oh, y'all were happy. They were upset. Okay. It's like you marvel, like, I don't believe, I don't believe he broke the Sabbath. I don't believe he had that man carrying the bed on the Sabbath. Okay. So he said, I did one work and you all marvel. And then it gets into the definition of, I'm going to say religious work. So then Jesus says, Moses therefore gave you circumcision, not that it is from Moses, but from the father's. And you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. Okay, so this is where we get into Jesus saying that they, they break the law. Okay, um, because they say he broke the law, but he's saying, look at what you do. So again, we look back. Circumcision really came through Abraham. Okay, but they want to make sure that they did not break that covenant with God. OK, that was that Abrahamic covenant with God by circumcising. And remember, they had to circumcise a baby boy on the eighth day. OK, so the eighth day. Well, that's the eighth day, depending on baby born. That means, OK, that they circumcised some men on the Sabbath. Well, their idea, the way they're looking at this or the way we believe they're looking at this, you don't want to say it that way since I wasn't there, is that um, they have to obey the covenant because it's an everlasting covenant. And so that's religious work. So they have to do religious work on the Sabbath, okay? And also they cannot break Abraham's, the covenant that God made with Abraham. And so, but they're doing work. Because they're taking a knife and cutting off their foreskin, and that would be considered work. You know, you take a knife to cut something, that's considered work. Now, Jesus says, so you, you're trying to obey that covenant law, that covenant, um, that covenant. And then he says, verse 23, if a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath, so that the law of Moses should not be broken, okay? Are you angry with me because I made a man completely well on the Sabbath? So in other words, it's like circumcision came in a sense before the law of Moses. Okay. We came with the Abraham, Abrahamic covenant. Okay. Came in Genesis. I, that's why I went, kept emphasizing that. The law of Moses came in Exodus. Yet. They knew that they needed to circumcise, so they went ahead and did the circumcision if it fell on the Sabbath day, even though that looked like work. So he's trying to say, you're, in a sense, you broke the law by doing work on the Sabbath day, but trying to fulfill the covenant. But now you're upset with me because I made someone completely well on the Sabbath day. He said, I want you to think about that. So again, Luke 6, 9b, and I gave you this scripture last week says, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to, or to destroy? And so he's saying, when I healed the man at the pool of Bethesda on the Sabbath day, when I healed the man with dropsy on the Sabbath day, okay, he, he's saying it's important to do good on the Sabbath. It's important to save life on the Sabbath and if you didn't break the law by you circumcising on the Sabbath, I didn't break the law either. And remember, Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. And so then this is part of an excerpt I gave you last week, but just a little bit. First, the Sabbath was intended to help people not burden them. This is from GodQuestions.org. For someone to forbid acts of mercy and goodness on God's day of rest is contrary to all that is right. So remember, this healing was doing something that was merciful, doing something 
that was good, okay, and thus fulfilling the law. And then finally, Jesus says to them, judge correctly. He says, do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. So I'm giving you this verse again, but from the Message Bible. This is John 7, 24 from the Message Bible. And it says, don't be hypercritical. Use your head and your heart to discern what is right, to test what is authentically right. So they're trying to decide about him. Remember before our lesson? Oh, he's good. No, he's a deceiver. Okay. And he's saying, don't be hypercritical. Use your head and your heart to discern what is right, to test what is authentically right. Because the Sabbath was set up to help people, not to burden them. And so even as circumcision is for built for is, excuse me, fulfilling the Abraham. Abrahamic covenant, so healing someone is doing good, showing God's goodness on the Sabbath. Because again, if they just go by letter of the law, okay, the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Okay, the spirit gives life. What did, why did God create the Sabbath for life? Now, that's the last scripture in our lesson, but I do have some questions for us. Are we trying to decide if a teacher is trustworthy? You might try to decide that about me. Are you trying to decide if a teacher is speaking the truth or not? And then I have the question, who are you following? Because in the social media days, you have people say, oh, I follow this, I follow that, I'm following this person, I'm following that person, which means that they're following their, whether that's um, following them on Instagram or whatever other um, Twitter or whatever they're using, that's, they're looking at what they say. They're, they're in a sense um, becoming a disciple of that or person, someone following them, trying to just, you know, say, oh, they said this, so that's important. Oh, they said that, so I need to do that. Oh, they do this, so I need to do that. Or, oh, I want to know what they're doing all the time. So they're following it. And I thought about that with this lesson about who are you following? Because there's so many young people and the older ones too now, um, all people, I should say, who are following someone on social media. And so it comes down to, here's the litmus test. And litmus basically means decisively or indicative. Okay, test. This is the test, and this is the test that I want you to use when you're looking at Sunday school from um, lessons that I'm presenting to you. And it comes from 1 Corinthians 11, 1, and this is from the International Children's Bible, this particular version, but it basically says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. And the way I normally say it is follow me as I follow Christ. If I'm not following Christ, then don't follow me. If I'm not following Christ, pray for me. Okay, but if I'm not following Christ, don't follow me. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. So when you're looking at teachers and whether someone is speaking the truth, are they following the example of Christ? Is Jesus trustworthy? Yes. Is a teacher good? Is a teacher bad? As far as for the word of God or, or for life, you know, meaning of life, follow them as they follow the example of Christ. Follow them as they follow Christ. And if they're not following Christ, don't follow. This is our lesson for this Sunday. Be blessed. Loving Christ, Sister Sharon.